Are you me? Can you imagine being on that plane? You're just sitting there, sipping on your champagne in first class, nicely reclined, and there's a f-ing turkey going off next to you. Why is this turkey on the plane? Whose f-ing service animal is this? And how did things get this far? Just before we get started, today's video is brought to you by our friends over at Magic Spoon. Mm-hmm. 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 Oh. Oh! Oh! Yes! Okay, it's good. It's good. We know it's good. It's Magic Spoon. That's what it's all about. Magic Spoon is cereal re- reinvented. Imagine that childlike joy you had when you were a kid. You go down for breakfast, you get the milk out, you get that giant box of cereal out, you pour a bowl, you pour some more, you pour some more, you eat all that sugar, all of that sugary goodness, because you're a child! And you just burn it away as energy or whatever. I don't know, why do we all, you know... <laughs> Why do we have- you get old and you're like, oh no, I have to think about what I eat now. Rubbish! But Magic Spoon bring the childlike joy of cereal back for adults, and they do it by making cereal that is actually healthy. Check this out. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of net protein, and only 4 to 5 grams of net carbs in each serving. Star note here, Honey Nut has one gram of sugar. So it does. (laughs) Oh, I can talk about the cereal bars! I didn't know whether I was allowed to talk about these yet, but obviously I can. They sent me these cereal bars. They're like made from Magic Spoon and they're delicious. These are like great snacks. I mean, honestly, I also snack on Magic Spoon cereal, but this is like designed for it. It's wonderful. You can build your very own variety box and choose from the best-selling cocoa fruity frosted peanut butter. That is the legit one. Cookies and cream, maple waffles, plus other awesome flavors. Guys. You are updating your flavors of cereal more often than you're updating your copy points because on here you don't have this new one, chocolate chip cookie, which uh, I haven't actually tasted yet. I had this s'mores one. S'mores? S'mores? I don't even know. Look, I didn't even know what this was. I think it's that thing where you put the marshmallow between the biscuit and like when you're camping, right, Americans? That is an American thing, but that's what I was eating today and it's good. Um, so what is the crack? Well, go to Magic Spoon and build your very own variety box. And if you use my code Blaze, you'll get $5 off. Click the link below, use the code Blaze, $5 off, magicspoon.com slash Blaze, $5 off your order today. Also, for my Canadian British fans, Magic Spoon's now shipping to Canada and the UK. Brilliant! And now today's video. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, I am your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Well, I haven't seen Danny writes me a script. Yes, I have it in front of me right here. Things Americans think are totally normal, others find bizarre. <laughs> Here's one example. Mass shootings. And on that cheery note, let us begin. Boom, boom, boom. Maybe I should fake, but I don't. It's the beginning of yet another fun-packed day at school, and you've already got a lot of important stuff bubbling away in your young and troubled mind. You forgot to do last night's homework, and your dog ate your PE kit again. And then Gripper Nelson has just threatened to duff you up at break time because you squealed to the teachers about the great tuck shop heist. <laughs> The thing about not doing the homework and the forgetting the PE kit or the dog eating the PE kit is like a slice of my life. The number of times be like, you know, you get on the bus on the way to school and uh, your mate would be like, oh yeah, man, last night's maths homework was so hard. You'd be like, there was maths homework? <laughs> oh! <laughs> and then you're like trying to do it on the bus. It's like a 10 minute journey to school and it's extremely difficult. You're like, oh God. <laughs> oh God, oh no. <laughs> The panic, and then the number of times I forgot my PE kit, and sometimes it was, yeah, I just forgot it, like, because I just didn't want to do PE, because if you didn't bring your PE kit, all you had to do was sit in a classroom, and I was like, yeah, I'd just rather sit in a classroom than do PE, to be honest, because PE's a bit sh. But before you can worry too much about any of that, you first need to go through the daily morning ritual with the rest of the class, and that involves standing up, placing your hand over your heart, and reciting a pledge of allegiance to the flag that you're all facing. Wait! Oh, I remember I once talked about this and I really thought you sang the national anthem. Like, uh, uh, all I can think of is God Save the Queen, which is obviously not the American national anthem. But it should be. Uh, how's it goes? Like, is it Star Spangled Banner, right? From sea to shining sea, some like that, right? I thought you were singing that, but you actually do the Pledge of Allegiance, which is also like mental. If someone started the day in the UK and was like, we all have to say allegiance to the Queen, then everyone would be like, fuck off. <laughs> That's not happening. No, we're not doing that. Because uh, we're just not that patriotic. Yeah. 
just the truth of it. We just don't care. Unless there's a war on, then it'll be like, how old are you, Timmy? I'm 40. I mean, I'm, se I'm 18, sir. I'm old enough to join in the war. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually how it was in the past, but there were like young kids going off to fight in the war, like the big wars, like one and two. Um, like when they were too young, which was intense. I got scared. I dropped my hot pocket. The fuck? This is because you live in America and pledging allegiance to a bit of cloth every morning is how you roll in the land of the free. Wait, you do it to a cl Oh, like to a flag? But it, the flag symbolizes America, Danny. Come on, it's not like you're actually literally pledging allegiance to the specific flag that's probably made in China that's hanging up in that American classroom, right? Very valuable. I love China. Most countries tend to take a bit of pride in their own flags with the exception of the UK. I was just gonna say this. <laughs> I know what Danny's gonna say. I can't even see it yet. But he's gonna say like, if you wave a flag around a bit too much in the UK, it's like, what, you're a bit of a racist? <laughs> Do you love colonialism? Where if you're caught waving a flag about in any other, in any situation that doesn't involve sport, you'll likely get accused of being a bit of a far-right racist nutter. But America's devotion to the flag flies at way higher altitude than most. Yeah, there are no houses in the UK where there is an English flag or a Union Jack flying outside, unless it's like the Queen's house or some shit. Because if you had a flag, and in America you're like just driving through the suburbs and it's like, oh, look at these American flags everywhere. If someone's got like that English flag flying in the UK, you, you do just assume that they're a bit of an idiot. It's like, you know, because for some reason it's not just associated with national pride. It's also associated with like not wanting uh, people from other countries in our country. So racism. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, for the best, really. <laughs> but America's devotion to the flag flies at a way higher altitude than most. It's not about the flag, though, Danny, is it, America? No one actually is like, oh, literally love the flag. You, when you say, although people do say that, but it's mean you, it means you love America. It means, like, America, the greatest country in the world, in a few limited statistics. Uh, you'll find the dawning homes. <laughs> I'm gonna catch some heat for that one. America is the greatest. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Is the best in all statistics, especially school shootings. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I do. I, I think America's great. Wow. You'll find it adorning homes, public buildings, baseball caps, underwear, homeless people, and every class in the school. And up until 1943, it was mandatory for most children to pledge allegiance to the Stars and Stripes every morning until the Supreme Court ruled that it was a violation of First Amendment rights. Freedom of speech? First Amendment? Maybe? Yeah, that's true. You don't have freedom of speech. Like, SAY THE WORDS! I don't want to SAY THEM! But, yeah, ow. <laughs> But you'll still hear cases of kids wrongfully getting handed detentions for refusing to join in. And few children would dare opt out in fear of being branded a communist and getting beaten up by Gripper Nelson and his gang of patriotic mates at break time. The strange thing is that if an American saw footage of North Korean school children kicking off the day by blindly pledge allegiance to Kim Jong-un, then they might conclude that the kids are being brainwashed in a sinister cult ritual. There's a slight difference there, because Kim Jong-un is a man, whereas pledging allegiance to a flag is representative of the idea of a America and democracy and all of that sh a little bit different. Not not very different though. <laughs> oh, good times. Yeah. And yet this is kind of how it looks to the rest of the world, but American school kids place their hands over the heart and recite a pledge of loyalty to an inanimate object in the name of freedom, liberty, and democracy. It gets even stranger when you delve into the murky roots of the pledge, an early version of which was composed by Francis Bellamy, the editor of Youth Companion magazine in 1892. That sounds like a thrilling read. It's a companion to my youth. Brilliant. When Francis encouraged schools to take the daily pledge, it was largely just a marketing stunt to help his magazine sell sh loads of flags and them as part of the deal. Francis was also an appalling racist who viewed immigrants as a threat to traditional American values. So uh, Francis was a Native American then, was he? I'm gonna I'm gonna guess f no. <laughs> and felt that the pledge would force immigrants into demonstrating loyalty to the US rather than their current tree of origin. And if all that wasn't bad enough, it now seems increasingly likely that Francis stole the words from a 13-year-old boy. 
<laughs> so he's an appalling racist who hates immigrants. And he also stole the thing he's most famous for from a 13-year-old. Well done, Francis, you classic bellends. We don't give a fuck! Girl, fuck them kids, yeah. Despite one sounding affidavits under oath, under oath that he was the sole author, it's long been suggested that a young boy, very confusingly named Frank Bellamy, sent in the pledge as part of a competition run by Youth Companion in 1890 and heard no more about it. And a very recent discovery of a newspaper article from 1890 reveals how a class in Kansas were reciting a pledge with almost identical wording two years before Big Frank allegedly came up with it. So it appears that the pledge was officially written by a racist who plagiarized the words from a school kid to sell more flags. To be fair, every school across the world has its own weird traditions here in the uk we don't exactly pledge daily allegiance to the queen or to mr blobby but we do get coerced into saying prayers to an invisible man in the sky yeah we do which is equally balmy oh my god i know i am not a religious man as you probably know by now but i pretty sure i know all the words that lord's prayer i mean yeah it's like off with your prayer we don't have that freedom of religion the separation of church and state we're all into that I mean, like, my school had a church like a chapel but it was like a proper church it was big you could fit like all 500 skids in there bing, 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 bong, 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 bong. Get those off. Bing, 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 bing. and yeah we had to go there twice a week and do all this religious shit that no one cares about i mean people did care about it, it, was, it wasn't very many <laughs> Mostly we're just spend time shouting. <laughs> I told my mate uh, the other day in a video I mentioned how uh, when we'd do that thing and you know that the priest would be like, Christ will come again. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And you'd have to repeat after him, you know. And we'd always be shouting. We'd be like, Christ will come <laughs> again. And my mate was like, yeah, I remember that. Do you remember how we used to also shout hymns? <laughs> so it'd just be like everyone would be singing. <laughs> And someone would just be like, shh, shh, guys, 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 shout this one as loud as you can. <laughs> so it'd be like, you know, rub, like eight of us just absolutely belting out of him, like, shh, not singing loudly, but like, I did those beats! <laughs> oh my god, this is not funny to anyone else because you don't have the memories that I have, but I'm just having a good time telling you that story, to be honest. Well, that is very interesting. Please tell me more. Maybe schools would be better off just focusing on the actual teaching. <laughs> yeah, maybe they would be, Danny. They probably would be. The most valuable lesson I ever learned at school was that sticking my fingers down my throat should be sick. <laughs> Danny, mate, what are you learning at school? I'm being sick. And being sick all over the desk was the most effective way of getting out of Mrs. Patch's cookery class. Danny, home ec was like the highlight of the week. I remember like one year I had, it was Wednesdays and I just remember Wednesdays. It started off with double English maths, which was basically an hour and 20 minutes of an English lesson, which I hated because I don't know, I just hated English class. And then there was a 40 or 35 minutes, hour and 20, it was about 40 minutes each lesson or 35 minutes then with a five minute break to get to your next class. So the bell would go off and you'd have to like, you know, do, 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 why am I telling you? You know how school works. Almost everyone watching this video has been to school. You're familiar with the school system of bells and lessons. But then, 11 o'clock rolls around and the day is golden. Because it... Oh my god, I just remembered. No, no, no. I had an even better... No one cares about this, Simon, but I'm going to finish the story. There was one Wednesday... where I had double drama, so theater studies, which was my favorite. Then unfortunately, there was 35 minutes of mass slotted in. Then 11 o'clock comes around, break time. Then it was double uh, home economics, where you just go and cook some shit for like an hour and 20 minutes. Then it was lunch for an hour. And then in the afternoon, it was cadets. F brilliant. And then it was home early. Got home, went home at five o'clock on a Wednesday. That was great. Now every day I get to do what I want, which is kind of nice. Like, because you'd go to school, you'd be like, oh man, I mean, Wednesday's good, but I still got like 35 minutes of maths. Nowadays, I'm just like, I guess I do what the f I want every day, pretty much. It's great. 
Price tags that lie. Being a simple soul, I like the idea of a price tag which tells you exactly how much you'll need to pay at the store counter. Yeah, what the f America. You go to a, you go. Like, I've talked about restaurants before, but it's like you go and he's like, yeah, yeah. I need. Uh, you just go into an electronics store and it's like, okay, I need a computer or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's computers, nine hundred ninety nine dollars, and then you take it to the counter and it's like a hundred and one thousand one hundred and fifty. You're like, what the f is this? And they're like, oh, we added on the VAT at the counter. And it's like, well, how about you tell me how much it is? And then you'll be in some other states, and you'll be like, no, it's 999. And you're like, what the f America? And it's like, why not? Well, we don't have, uh, not VAT. Um, what do you call it? Sales tax. Why is there no sales tax here? It's just like, we don't have sales tax in this state. And it's like, why the f doesn't everyone live here then? <laughs> what the f? Why so confusing? This is the United States of America, for God's sake. Most of the rest of the world would agree, but it's a different story in the United States where customers end up playing a bizarre game of number wang in which the store assistant pretty much spins a roulette wheel to determine how much more you'll be paying than the price tag advertised. And that's because the sales tax is never included on the tag. In most other countries, the value added tax, VAT, is factored into the display price to avoid any unwelcome surprises at checkout. Each separate phase of production has already been taxed on the product's long journey to the shelf, but the sales tax system of the US makes for this makes this concept far more difficult. The variable amounts of sales tax slapped onto a product is set by each state or even by each county. In fact, there are almost 10,000 different taxing jurisdictions in the United States. And as someone who runs a business has to deal with VAT, it's already f fucking complicated. Like, I don't really understand it. My accountant will be like, uh, yeah, and you have this much VAT to pay. And I'm like, okay, because <laughs> I have no idea how the f it works. She's tried explaining it to me so many times, and I'm just like, I don't, I, I just, I don't get it. I just don't. And if there were 10,000 jurisdictions, I'd be like, well, I guess I'd just be in one of those jurisdictions. But look, it's just going to be unnecessarily complicated. <laughs> and this causes a problem for big multi-state retailers who like to roll out fixed prices in nationwide marketing campaigns and for items such as books, which usually come packaged with pre-printed prices. You can't expect an advertising campaign to run through 10,000 10, different prices or a book to include 10,000 different potential tax variations on the back. It'd be like, how long is the book? Four pages. How long is the pricing list? Seventy pages is still a very short book this wasn't a great joke or example let's move on so the answer to that is to let the retailers toss up the tax at the counter it's really annoying though america this can be incredibly confusing for tourists who are used to paying the price that they fucking see <laughs> that is not complicated come on and many travel websites list this tax quirk as one of the most important traps to avoid falling into when visiting the US for the first time. It's not a trap. It's not like they're tricking you. It's the price. It's like, oh, you fell for that. A trap is where they're like, yeah, it's actually, that was advertised as 100, it's actually 200. And you'll be like, is that sales tax? They'll be like, yeah, 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 that's what we call it, sales tax. And he's just ripping you off. That would be a trap. The other one is just that. <laughs> You're going to feel a bit silly if you find out that you haven't actually got enough money to pay for all those cans of root beer now that you're going, and now you're going to have to put some of them back. It's not like. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. It still happens to me, Sonny. It's like, oh no, I don't have any. I forgot. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough cash. And they don't accept cards. And you're like, I'm a 35 year old man. It's like, okay, yeah, I just guess I'll put the Coke back. <laughs> It's like sometimes you just go there and it's like, I still get embarrassed. Like, you know, when you're paying for something, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, your card's been declined. And it's like, I, it's like my, I've got plenty of money in there, but still their cards just, and you're like, oh, give it another go. And it's like, no, nah, no, nah, it's declined. You're like, oh, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I don't have any cash. And it's like, I'll just use a different card. That one's been declined. Nah, it's almost never declined on the second go around. Except one time, some guy came to my house and I'm like paying. Is that, for some reason, it's like I had to pay by card when I got something delivered. And he's like, mate, that card's been declined. And I'm like, oh, okay, just try this. Use this other one then. And it's like, it's been declined as well. And I'm like, what about this this one? And he's like, do you have any cash, mate? Because your cards ain't working. And then eventually he's like, oh, no, my machine doesn't have any reception. And I'm like, what are you fucking stupid? So I had to live through this fucking embarrassment because your machine didn't have any reception in my hallway. Fuck you. <laughs> Fortunately, there was no one else there, so it wasn't actually embarrassing. But if there was, I would have, people would be like, oh, Mr. Whistler in apartment 12, bit of a broke ass brokey. I'm broke, I'm broke. 
It's not that they have to be some sort of mathematical genius to work out the final price. In most cases, the best policy is to just mentally add around 10% to everything you're buying. Which, uh, honestly, 10% is pretty good. Well, it's 21% here. And you're, I mean, it's all wrapped into the price. But it's just like, that's why just more expensive. Although sometimes it's just more expensive anyway. Like, you look at the Apple store and it's like, how much is that? Oh, it's $1,100. And then you look at the price in, in Europe and you're like, oh, so it's £1,100 or €1,100. And you're like, what the f***, man? I know Euros and pounds are worth more than dollars. Why the f*** are you doing this to me? And it's like, oh, it's that bat. And it's like, that doesn't add up. <laughs> You're right, he's ripping me off. If anybody should be getting more, it's you. He's ripping me off. But I can't see why it would just be so hard for each store to display the relevant sales tax amount right next to the main price tag. Perhaps there's a good reason why Americans prefer it this way, though. Whereas most customers around the world probably don't give any thought to how much tax they've paid on a bunch of bananas, Americans are always acutely aware of exactly how badly they're being fleeced by the government. <laughs> yeah, we never think about that. We never think that everything is just 21% more expensive than it would be otherwise. It's just like, that's the price of things. <laughs> F***ing hell. Cold turkey. There can't be any more full-on bonkers traditions in the United States than the day on which the serving president takes the time to pardon a live turkey. Bill Clinton mentioned during one of the presidential turkey pardons that he was following in the footsteps of Abraham Lincoln and Harry Truman. Is this the thing, like, it's on Thanksgiving, right? When everyone, like, everywhere is, like, slaughtering turkeys to eat them en masse, and the president's like... Well, it's okay, because this one, we're letting go. That would be like, it's like, yeah, yeah, Hitler and the Jews. It'd be like, what did you do? Well, we killed 11 million Jews. Um, but don't worry, we found this one guy, and uh, we pardoned him. So it's all good, and Nuremberg be like, yeah, bro, sounds good, bro. <laughs> uh... But Bill should have brushed up a bit more in his turkey part in history. In fact, it's a relatively modern phenomenon which was inspired by a combination of question deflection, animal activism, and poultryless Thursdays. <laughs> what the f is a poultryless Thursday? Is that the one day of the week you don't eat chicken? <laughs> it's like six days of the week you eat chicken. <laughs> I bet the chicken industry was not pleased about poultryless Thursdays. It's rumored that Abraham Lincoln once saved a turkey from the White House dinner table after his son Tad formed a bond with it and began walking around with the turkey on a leash as if it was a pet. <laughs> Tad was a little bit, uh... <laughs> But there's not much evidence to back that up. It's certainly true that Harry Truman was the serving president during the inaugural National Thanksgiving turkey presentation in 1947, but there was no mention of a pardon at this stage. Quite the opposite, in fact. The live bird gifted by the National Turkey Federation was a kind of truce offering very much intended for the presidential belly. Following the Second World War and the subsequent food shortages across Europe, the Truman administration were encouraging U.S. citizens to help conserve grain for overseas aid by observing meatless Thursdays and poultry... Uh, meatless Tuesdays, sorry, and poultryless Thursdays. <laughs> the poultryless Thursday is basically just steak Thursday. <laughs> it's like, hell yeah. This is the United States of America, for God's sake. This didn't go well down with the National Poultry and Egg Board, uh, uh, who felt their industry was under attack. And they were not wrong, were they, though? 1947's Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Day, and New Year's Day fell on Thursdays, which meant that the government was making everyone feel uncomfortable about tucking into their traditional turkey dinners as a compromise. Poultryless Thursdays were renamed Eggless Thursdays. Ah. <laughs> after some heavy lobbying by the chicken industry. And Truman was seen publicly accepting a live winged gift to, d to demonstrate that you would no longer be letting the side down for daring to eat poultry on Thanksgiving Day. D how's this work? Because one turkey was let off the hook, so now it's okay for an entire nation to slaughter them all? And don't get me wrong, I got no problem with slaughtering turkeys. I quite like turkey. I mean, it's not the best meat, but it's not bad. I quite like turkey thighs. I roast them up in the oven. It's delicious. But it doesn't make it okay just because you you pardoned one. <laughs> Refer to my example of Hitler. In 1963, JFK became the first president to show sympathy for the annual doomed donation from the National Turkey Federation, possibly put off a little bit by the sign hanging around the turkey's neck, which read good luck. Which read, good eating, Mr. President JFK suggested to the crowd, it might be nice to spare this one. <laughs> the lucky turkey outlived JFK. 
who was assassinated three days later. In later years, Nixon, Carter, and Reagan also gave the turkeys a last-minute reprieve from the kitchen knife by sending them off to petting zoos instead of eating them. It was Reagan who first jokingly sparked the idea of a pardon in 1987 in an off-the-cuff comment to journalists who were badgering him during the ceremony about whether he might pardon his former aides who had been accused of wrongdoing in the Iran-Contra scandal. <laughs> It's a little bit of a different thing, isn't it? It's got to be weird working for the president, because you can be up to all sorts of shady ass sh and you'll be like, yeah, but we're gonna, you, you can pardon us all, which is weird. So we just got a free pass, basically, which is pretty intense. I mean, if you do it on time, <laughs> if you're not president anymore, then they're kind of fucked. In a bid to dodge answering the question, Reagan quipped that he might pardon the turkey he was facing, and it was his successor, George W. Bush, who... No. No. Reagan, George H. W. Bush. Uh, original JB. Original GB. No? Who took the idea further by launching the first official presidential turkey pardon in 1989, perhaps partly in response to the animal rights activists who were noisily clucking around the White House at the time. It's an annual tradition which has been followed ever since, and let's hope it continues for at least another thousand years. Obama was perhaps the president who most openly mocked the whole idea, once cheekily suggesting that he might eat the turkey instead of pardoning it. And during his very first turkey pardon in 2009, he solemnly noted, there are certain days that remind me of why I ran for this office. And then there are moments like this, where I pardon a turkey and send it to Disneyland. <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those things where it's like, what the f*** are you doing? You're the president. Go do some, I don't know, go figure out some abortion sh Go deal with some wars. Literally, why are you doing this? It's stupid. Your time is very valuable. We don't even know that we have the cards because our leaders don't understand the game. That last bit was entirely true. Between 2005 and 2009, Disney teamed up with the National Turkey Federation to ensure that all the pardoned turkeys were flown first class to Disneyland or Disney World, where they were given the honor of serving as Grand Marshals during the parade. Are you f***ing me? Can you imagine being on that plane? You're just sitting there, sipping on your champagne in first class, nicely reclined. And there's a f***ing turkey going off next to you. Why is this turkey on the plane? Whose f***ing service animal is this? And how did things get this far? Of course, it's all just a bit of harmless fun, even if it doesn't really make any sense, as it's not clear what crimes the turkey was supposed to have committed in the first place. But it's better than the president strangling a goose or something every Thanksgiving day. Is that how they did it before? They just strangle it to death? And perhaps it's still more credible than some of the presidential human pardons over the years, which have included George W. Bush pardoning a criminal after receiving a $10,000 donation from him. No. What? Is, is, you're the Bush family. You're f***ing rich. It's 10 grand, mate. You shouldn't do that. It tarnishes your legacy something royal. Gerald Ford pardoning disgraced President Richard Nixon after the Watergate scandal. Bill could, Bill, Richard Nixon could have pardoned himself, though, couldn't he? Bill could into pardoning his own brother after he was convicted of cocaine possession and drug trafficking. What? And Trump briefly pond pondering if he might be able to pardon himself. The drinking age limit. I can vividly remember the moment I walked into the Dog and Bollock on my 18th birthday and ordered my first legal pint of lager. It wasn't the first time I'd drunk lager in a pub. I think I was already barred from three different pubs in town by this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> the day I turned 18 was the first time I drank in a pub Oh, when I wasn't, you know, nervous about getting asked my ID. <laughs> I don't remember the first time I drank in a pub when I was 18 because it was not a special event. But I felt like a major life event to be able to buy it legally, and it seems incredible that when it comes to buying alcohol, the US shares more in common with the strict rules of Iraq than the rest of the developed world. If I'd lived in the US, I would have had to wait until I turned 21, and fuck that. <laughs> yeah. So true. I remember I went to it, like me and my mate, we were, uh, I take a trip every year with a mate of mine from school. And uh, one of the first trips we took was to America because we turned 21. And we were like, dude, we can drink in America now. Let's go. So we went for like a month. <laughs> it was awesome. Um, it was good. It was a good trip. And we drank. Boy, did we drink. 
If you go back to the Prohibition days, you couldn't vote, enlist in the army, or drink alcohol until you reached 21, which was the widely accepted age of maturity. But after the minimum age for military draft was reduced to 18 during the Second World War and the legal voting age was dropped to 18 in 1971, many states began applying the same logic to the purchase of alcohol. After all, if you were old enough to go forth and kill other human beings in a war, surely you were old enough to enjoy a refreshing beer afterwards. And as I understand it, you can't drink until you're 21. Like, in the UK, as far as I'm aware, and like Europe, it's not about drinking, it's about purchasing alcohol. If you uh, are drinking, like at home, your parents' alcohol, that is not a crime. You're allowed to drink. It's just you can't buy alcohol. But in America, you'd be like, uh-oh, you don't want to be doing that. Have I got that wrong? That just sounds so insane. Also, when I was a kid, you could uh, drink in a restaurant if you were ordering a meal if you were 16. So if you were ordering a meal, you could have one, you could order like a beer or a glass of wine when you were 16, which was uh, weird. I don't think I ever did that because my it was like a weird law, but I think you'd have to explain it to the restaurant. So let's uh, chop this. <laughs> <laughs> But organizations such as Mothers Against Drunk Driving were not quite happy about this, suggesting that lowering the legal alcohol age had directly led to a spike in the number of fatal traffic accidents. By 1984, Reagan had introduced the National Minimum Drinking Age Act, which technically left the matter in the hands of individual states, but deducted 10% from highway funds for states who didn't increase the age limit to 21. Within just a few years, every single state had complied. It's been argued that the policy was a success, as there was a sharp drop in traffic accidents reported between 1982 and 1990 although this decline could be down to a number of other crucial factors such as improvement in safety design and the mandatory airbag. Yeah, <laughs> seatbelts have made a real big difference. And it seems that most Americans are happy with the idea of waiting three extra years. A recent survey from the Center for Alcohol Policy concluded that 86% of Americans support the surprisingly strict age limit. Is that really so high? <laughs> Ask a 20 year old that same question. But perhaps the real problem back in the 70s was that the states just couldn't agree on an alcohol age limit. This made it possible for under-21s to buy alcohol if they drove to the next state, leading directly to that spike in traffic accidents as the kids went wild on beard runs. <laughs> That would be epic. That kind of sounds cool. If you live in a state, yeah, you got to drive to the next state. That would just be like epic adventures. Epic drunken adventures. It might have made more sense if the same age limit was set for every adult across every state, but instead you've got situations in which a 20-year-old soldier can risk their life while defending their country, but can't be trusted with a beer when they get back home again. <laughs> Whilst meanwhile, a 14-year-old kid with a legal driving license is crashing his car into the local candy store. No. <laughs> There's no way you can have a driver's license at 14, Danny. Right? Yes, I can! At least the soldier can legally enjoy a homemade lemonade when they get home, but sadly it will be as flat as a witch's tit because America never even figured out that proper lemonade should be fizzy. What? Lemonade's not fizzy in America? Lemonade's fizzy? What are you talking What? I'm learning this today. I know there's like flat lemonades, but they're like a niche product. Lemonades fizzy, like Sprite, right? What are we talking about? That's the end of today's video. Oh my God, this is not funny to anyone else because you don't have the memories that I have, but I'm just having a good time telling you that story, to be honest. Well, that is very interesting. Please tell me more.